All right. Thank you for that thundering applause. And thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you guys for allowing me to come here and speak to you. This is, uh, this is a privilege. This is an honor to be surrounded by the best of the best of so putting this together of what could actually be useful and informative and awesome for you guys. Uh, it was a lot of fun putting this presentation together over the last couple of weeks. I got to put my glasses on here if you'll excuse me. About three years ago, I was pitching to my oldest son, Colt. He's 10 now. Back then, he was seven, you know, hitting left-handed, obviously, and um, throwing these little plastic balls, these little, you know, hard golf ball-sized plastic balls, and I I throw one and he hits it. I don't even see it off the bat until it was right here. And it was green, it was lime green, because I'll never forget the lime green flash that right before I got my eyelid closed and bam, just drills me. And I knew it was bad as soon as it hit. And he's like, oh, dad. And I was like, you know, it's okay, buddy. And I'm thinking I'm gonna take my hand away. My eye's gonna fall out. And as soon, as soon as I open my eyes, it's like triple vision, just right away. And that didn't stop for a couple of weeks. So I, Go to the optometrist and he says, uh, you know, well, you just have to keep an eye on it, checks it out, no detached retina, no bruised cornea, nothing too serious. But ever since then, it's been like double vision, triple to double. So I go back and see him and he says, well, you just may have some degenerative condition in there. So I guess what I'm saying is if my vision keeps deteriorating, I will have to stop coaching and start umpiring. So... Uh -huh. Anyways, these are two circles we talk about with our players, and I want to share with you guys. Uh, and like Jeff mentioned, the last couple of years have been awesome just from, a, from an opportunity for growth and learning standpoint of just trying to live in that experiment-based circle or at least be in the middle. We talk to our players about how we want to be in that overlap part. The evidence-based stuff is, you know, by the time you read it, it, there's already been years of research that back it up. And so to, to get out of your comfort zone and to, to learn and grow and talk to people like Jeff and to go to the Titleist Performance Institute and meet with guys like Doug Latta and all the people that we find to just continue to, to challenge us and expand our, our knowledge, it's been, it's been wonderfully satisfying and rewarding uh, as a coach to see that happen. This is a an example of that. This is my presentation, basically, and um, you know our coaches are are awesome. At you know, it's one piece of advice is, is hire people smarter than you, and have done that. You know, Michael Bradar is here, and this is in his office, and we repainted the wall in whiteboard paint, and so we're just always throwing stuff up on the board, and it takes us down these rabbit holes, and you know that's uh, indicative of the culture of our program and we talk about growth all the time with our players and so we have to do it and model it as coaches as well and get out of our comfort zone and find ways to improve and get better and so uh, that was one area now I spoke a couple of years ago at the Indianapolis convention and this has been maybe the biggest shift for me I still think the information that I spoke about is good and we still talk about it today but it was reflective of some absolutes and some commonalities that maybe weren't custom to the player and what their body can do. So what's biometric driven coaching? Well, it's, it's body data. It's what, based on what the, what the player individually can do, not comparing them to still action shots of the very best players in the world. And that was what I did before. I was more of a technique driven guy uh, and would always, would always compare our players to major leaguers, even though that's not really fair to them. So what we've instead done is instead of always being about external cueing, hey, you can't do this, let's try this other drill, start to understand that maybe it's a little bit more about efficiency. And it's not one way to hit or pitch, but there's a lot of different ways to hit and pitch, but it's based upon what they can physically do. So we still have some key performance indicators that we talk about. We still want to hit it harder. We still want to score more runs. There's no downside to wanting to score more runs. There's no downside to wanting to hit it harder and have more bat speed. So we talk about all this in terms of how can we make good plate decisions, how can we have quality contact, and how can we have consistent contact. So in terms of our players and what they can physically do, we're always trying to build that engine. So 
We're still evaluating swings, we're still evaluating the body, but then the problem, the, the question for us, the opportunity for us is identifying, is this a technical issue with their swing or is this just something that they physically can't do? But we're gonna prioritize efficiency over style. And of course, telling players to do things they physically can't do, well, that's just bad coaching. So one of the things we learned at learning the golf industry, and I'm really appreciative of that we went the golf route before we went on base U. We're gonna do on base U as well, but by doing TPI first, we then had to make the correlations and the connections to the baseball world instead of the baseball people telling us what those correlations are. But in both you know, analyzing any athlete, the body's this alternating pattern of stable and mobile joints. And so we want to assess the stability, mobility, and strength of all of those joints. And so that's exactly what these series of, of screens are, is these level one screens. There's 16 different screens in the golf world. And then we've, I know on base U has theirs as well, but then we've taken these and then we've applied them to what our, what do our players pass or fail? And then from there, we create a report card for them, so to speak. So they see what, uh, they see what their target areas are for improvement. And then we design the corrective exercises that associate with that so that when we're putting these reports together, then we can customize it so it looks something more like this. So that's Akeo Thomas's corrective exercises card. They're prioritized with the things that he needs to work on the most. And he'll do a couple of these a few times a week where he's really targeting these corrective exercises. Now the guys on the right and their numbers there, those were the four biggest gainers in our program. Those are the guys that made the biggest improvements. See the level one screen is zero to 40. Zero is really good. You passed everything. 40 is really bad. Team average for us this year is about 27. This guy, Jimmy Kerr, up top here, we tested three times from November through the end of the season last year, so about every couple of months. And he improved his score from 23 to eight to zero. And you look at the comparison of his numbers in the, in the production from one year to the next. The next three guys on the list were our high three-ish draft picks. They were also three guys who had drafts the next three highest improvements as well. Jordan Brewer is a third rounder, Carl and Tommy were both second rounders, but both, all three of them, undrafted out of high school. Jordan was a junior college guy, so he was undrafted both years out of junior college. And so the improvements that we saw them make based on what their body can do added to their performance in a major way. And that was, that was really cool to see. One of the things that we've added that is still a little bit out of my comfort zone and understanding uh, but something that we have learned a great deal about just through the golf world and uh, with Jake Bivens, and who's a former player who's back there in the back with K-Motion, is just understanding some of these graphs. And so for us, we just try to make it very simple. And when we're looking at the red, which is the pelvis, the green, which is the torso, the blue, which is the lead arm, and the, the yellow, which is whatever you're holding on to, we just want to look, is the, is the tsunami intact? Stole that from TPI. Does the graph get bigger? Who starts the race? Does the pelvis start first? Do the hands finish last? Much like any race, it, it, who finishes the race is more important than who starts it. But identifying the power source, separation isn't just the pelvis and torso. It's, you can have separation between the torso and the lead arm, and the lead arm and whatever you're holding onto. And so when you can find those big gaps in order, so the red there is on top of the green and there's a big gap there, that guy's a core loader. And Jimmy Kerr, who hit 15 home runs and was a great player for us all last year, that was his power source. He was a big time core loader, but because of that, that also put him at risk for a lot of low back discomfort and injury, which happened to him uh, often throughout the season. And then much as important as it is to go fast, being able to stop fast, the deceleration is really critical. We use the phrase crashing the bike. So if getting back to that running the race, if you're chasing somebody and you grab onto the guy in front of you and you pull him back and you accelerate past him, we want to create those same types of movements as well. Uh, and then spine X factor or spine rotation X factor. This is something that we see in a lot of our most powerful hitters. The guy with the highest exit velos and easiest way to explain this is if I got two extension cords 
one on my torso, one on my pelvis, and I want to connect these at contact. I don't want to be disconnected. I want to connect them at contact and have the pelvis and the torso matched up. You see this power V. The three highest guys on our team that hit the ball 110 miles an hour or better line up this one pretty well. All right, and then this might be the biggest light bulb thing that, that we did uh, with our coaches, or a couple of us, was going out to uh, Southern California and doing the level two power certification. I know Driveline was there, the Dodgers were there, but this, this power testing was fascinating just because it talked about the kinematic firing sequence, but then how can you harness this energy? And so that was really cool uh, for us to see that and just learn really what power is. And the easiest way that we describe it, instead of going through all the equations, it's just force times velocity. We're just combining speed and strength. We want to be strong and move fast at the same time. And so that being said, the types of power that we talked about is that vertical thrust, that ability to take that energy from the ground. When you hit the ground, the ground hits back. So be able to take that energy from the ground move it up into your rotary power, which is your core, and then that arm chop power, whatever your arms are doing, and then finally the wrist power. And we saw a lot of our guys make the biggest speed gains just by unlocking that wrist. So those are the four types of power that we talk about. And then from there, we got to train it, or we got to test it, I should say. So the obvious one is the vertical jump. And then after that were the med ball tests. The, the usage for the med ball, the easiest way to do it is just take one pound of med ball for every 20 pounds of body weight. So everyone's using about a 10 pound ball, plus or minus a pound. The sit up and throw test is just what it sounds like. You lay down like in a sit up position, you hold the med ball over your head, you sit up and you throw it as far as you can. The seated chest pass, you sit in a chair, you take the med ball, you throw it out as far as you can. And then the baseline shot, just like it sounds, you get down and it's like a uh, you know, just throw it, use your entire body and throw it as far as you can. You do it on the right side and you do it on the left side or your dominant side, non-dominant side. The key for this is that you want to be able to, whatever you jump in vertical inches, you want to get as close to that in feet with the med ball. Okay, so for baseball players, they say instead of a one-to-one, -one, take about 85% of that. And then the baseline shot, you want to be about one and a half times and then the, uh, the non-dominant side within 10% of that. So here's my data here that when I did it, all right, now I wish I could say I had a 40 pound vest on with the vertical jump, but I didn't. But I jumped 25.8 inches. All right, and the sit up and throw test, I took a 10 pound ball, I laid down on the floor with my knees bent, I came up and I threw it as far as I could. And that was, that was pretty good, it was in range. All right, I threw it 25 feet, I jumped over 25 inches. That's good. Now look at the seated chest pass. I only threw that 17 feet. The baseline shot, that's in line. That's about one and a half times the jump. And then the, the non-dominant side's about 10%. So when you think about power, get back to the equation, force times velocity, speed and strength. All right, so the guy says, well, you know, kind of like Rachel, do you even lift? You know, it's like, do you, do you, you, you strong in the chest? It's like, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can bench. And he's like, well, if it's not a strength problem, then what is it? Well, it's a speed problem. Do you ever do any plyometric activity with your upper body? Do you ever do any med ball throws? No, I don't do any med ball throws. So that was my issue is the power was lacking on that pass because everything was strength based and not speed based. So getting back to this vertical thrust, these are two of our players that I'm gonna get back to and talk more about as, as I get going, but being able to harness this energy from the ground is really, really important. And so we learned this when we, did, when we went to the golf uh, certifications about how the long drive hitters have the highest vertical jumps on the PGA Tour, and the guys who win the long drive competitions, they're typically pretty good jumpers. So we wanted to see, is there any correlation with this and our players being able to hit it hard? And so this was pretty fascinating as well. And I'm not talking about swings in games. I'm just talking about building the engine, not driving the car, I'm not talking about their hard contact in a game, because hitting a baseball is totally different than just being able to hit it hard. But these were our players that we converted their vertical jump into watts. So just use the Sayers formula and it took their body weight 
and their vertical jump, and they put a certain amount of wattage, so PAPW, peak anaerobic power in watts, off the ground, and then what their exit velos are and plotted it. Pretty fascinating that our two guys that hit the hardest or have the highest exit velos also have the highest peak anaerobic power in watts or have the best, uh, have, that's directly correlated. We did the same thing with the pitchers, and it was the same result. The guys who throw the hardest also had the same wattage, generated the most wattage from the ground with their vertical jumps compared to their body weights. So we're looking at this, okay, what does this mean? Well, what we think it means is that the guys that are below the line, they're either lacking speed or strength, and the guys above the line are leaving something on the table. It could be technique, it could be that they have some kind of mental governor on them, that they're just not allowing themselves to go fast. So this was pretty fascinating when putting these together, and we'll continue to retest this. So that's testing the body. You just heard the blast data presentation, so we want to know what the bat is doing as well. So every swing we take in the cages, we have a blast sensor on it, and we love it. That's been a 1% better opportunity for growth for us, and we use the axe bats as well and want to be able to use the overload, underload of that testing to determine if we need more speed, if we need more strength, if it's an attack angle thing. Um, so, you know, what, is, what does all this mean? It's making these body swing connections. It's being able to understand how the player's bodies are moving and if it, is it a technical problem or is it a physical limitation? Those are the things that we need to take a look at. And what we want to do is we want to be a sniper, all right, when we're prescribing exercises for our player. We don't want to throw grenades. We want to be able to not just give our opinion, but be able to tell them with not, I wouldn't say certainty, but we want to give them a lot of really good information so when we're doing drills or we're talking to them in a very simple way that uh, this is what we're seeing and this is why we're doing it. So leading to that is the communication piece of you know, how we talk to these guys. We're not going to go up and, and tell our players um, the most high-level physics-based equations because they'll just look at me. But I'll, give you, I'll just give you a quick story. So we're in the cages earlier this fall, and uh, we have a player named Jesse. And Jesse's up there hitting, and we'll, we're, doing, uh, we're doing situations. So we're doing mock ABs. And he's got a 2-0 count in his cage. And so he gets up there. It's a 2-0 count. He gets a fastball, and it's like center cut. And he fouls it off over the opposite side, what would be the opposite side dugout. I go, Jesse, dude, 2-0. Like, that's a fastball count. You, you know, it, there's no way that should be a foul ball. If that's a foul ball, that's a hooking, screaming liner into the pull side bullpen. No way on a 2-0 and o count are you late on a fastball. Why are you late on the fastball? He's like, well, I just, you know, I didn't want to swing and miss if he threw me an off-speed pitch. I was like, well, it's a 2-0. and o. Like, Do you think the best hitters in the game are – worried about swinging and missing on an off-speed pitch on a 2-0 count? He's like, no. And I said, well, what do you think the best hitters in the game are thinking? He goes, I don't know, something in Spanish. <laughs> it's like, si, y necesitas batear una línea. A mí me gusta cuando hacerlo. No, so bilingual is not we got to speak Spanish. Bilingual is we got to be able to speak the nerd language, but we got to speak Neanderthal to our players at the same time. And we got to be able to simplify as much as we possibly can. This was a text one of our former players got. And if the guy who sent us in the room, I apologize. This kid meant nothing by it. But this was texted to him um, when our player sent in his data. And so this was what was, what was given back to him. And so, of course, he comes in and it's like, what's an AZ swing? I was like... Do, I don't know, um, but that's just confusing, all right? So we don't, we don't want to do that. Again, what it gets back to is this slide I showed you. We want to hit it hard. We want to score more runs. More is better for both. Our key performance indicators for the team and for each player about making good plate decisions, about making quality contact, building the engine. How, how good can you hit it? And then consistent contact. How often do you hit it good? So part of biometric-driven coaching is you know, getting into these key 
performance indicators. So for the players, you know, quality and consistent contact for them. If they want to get into OPS, that's fine. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with quality at bats, but their OPS is something that's simple and it's easy for us. We value WOBA, we value expected WOBA, we value run, run value per pitch, and we value expected run value per pitch. And those are the ones we really dive into. And run value per pitch and expected run value per pitch ties directly into the mental game that we teach, which is about winning pitches. So those go hand in hand together. And again, if like a company, there's, you know, it's like revenue. There's, there's no downside to scoring more runs. Even in the guys that already do a lot of this well, you can have more bat speed. We can score more runs for our team. So the first one, the key performance indicator for plate decisions. You know, for the player, if I'm just simplifying it for him, you know, do you swing at strikes and take balls? And so we took, we have a, a great team, and Michael Berdar runs a data analyst team of a bunch of student managers who are really smart, and they dissected all the TrackMan data of the top 100 WOBA hitters in Division I baseball in 2019. So that's where we got these percentages that you see. So these are the averages. And so those averages, 74% of the time, they swung at pitches in the heart of the plate. 64% of the time, they swung at pitches in the zone. They took balls out of the zone 79% of the time. And then 72% of the time, just make it correct decisions. Tango Tiger had this chart that I'm sure all of you saw the other day. But just if you're a pitcher or a pitching coach and looking at the expected run value when you waste a pitch compared to when you throw one right down the middle, uh, I just thought that was fascinating. So from a hitting standpoint, being able to take balls and get into good counts and being able to hold the zone and not chase, those are extremely valuable when it comes to run value and expected run value. So for plate decisions, you know, we got to educate our players first. Timing, when do they, we call them window one and window two, but basically be on time and swing at good pitches, right? So window one is simply when the pitcher's gathering his energy, we're going to gather our energy. Window two is when he makes a forward move, then we're making a forward move. That's about as super simple, basic Neanderthal as I could make it, just explaining that, even though we'd have to watch video to show it. But then looking, like you just heard the blast data about time to contact and rotational acceleration. Well, if your numbers are good there, all right, then you shouldn't, if, as long as you're on time, you should be able to make decent decisions. If you're not, and your time to contact is slow, or your rotational acceleration, you don't generate a lot, your accelerating speed isn't good, then you have to make decisions earlier. And that could lead you to not make uh, the best decision when you're swinging out of hand, or you're, not, you're, you're making that commitment to go, and it's too early to make that decision, whether it's a ball or a strike. The reason we really like understanding the firing sequence is just knowing does the pelvis start? Does the pelvis stop? Are the hands that are firing last? So can you check that swing? Right? We have a guy, we have a couple of guys that they start their pelvis, but they never stop it. And so it continues to go and go and go and go. And that means their hands, they're starting their swing. They're making a decision with their hands. Their hands aren't firing last. So they're making a decision much earlier. Right? So they don't make great plate decisions when that has to happen. So when we're training for this, if it's a technique issue, and then we're going to do a lot of vision and occlusion testing or occlusion training. So we'll have our guys stand in bullpens all the time. We use this numbered system with the balls. The plate's 17 inches wide. The ball's about two and a half inches wide. So we number them one through seven for righties and lefties. And we want to hit the three, four, five balls with less than two strikes as much as we possibly can. But our players need to know where those pitches are. They call them out. We use the synaptic strobe glasses all the time. I'd say almost daily. Uh, but we really like those. We really like how they um, create that ability to where you're, you know, you're taking their vision and you're, you're strobing it so they don't see it. Uh, and then calling out pitches that they would either swing at or not swing at in bullpens. And then we don't do very much block training in, in our BP sessions. It's a, it's a lot of random machines, uh, a lot of mix in BP. And then, you know, chaos with BP would just have them stand there with their eyes closed and tell them to open up and put the ball in the machine. But probably the biggest thing that we could do, if I could summarize it, we just try to train faster than the speed of the game. And if you can put a number on that, I'd say by 
you're, you're facing a guy throwing 90 and you put the machine at 99, you're playing defense and you got a 4-2 runner but your defense has to make plays in 3-8, whatever. Playing offense, defense, play the game, do training above game speed, the game can slow down. If it's a physical limitation, then we might have to repattern that kinematic sequence and then we'll resort back to our, to our TPI corrective exercises. For quality contact, all right, whether it's golf, whether it's baseball, if you're analyzing a projectile, right, you're looking at ball speed, trajectory, spin, so exit velo launch and spin, you know, not even factoring in what the air is doing, because we all know you can do everything right, and if the wind's howling in, it's not going anywhere. But those are the three main things that we're talking about with quality of contact. So with exit velo, you know, again, building the engine, how hard can you hit it, all right? What's your average exit velo? The top 100 WOBA hitters in college last year were about 85, and their hard hit percentage was about 45. All right, so if I ask the room, because these are you guys are all really, really smart baseball people, but a really simple question: What's a good hit? How do you quantify a good hit? Right? You might get 200 different answers. So we just want to very simply: What's a good hit? Well, you know, 95 or harder between 10 and 30 degrees of launch. That's a good hit, pretty much for everybody. When you hit it on the barrel, you know, not enough spin. That's not good. Too much spin. That's not good. So that 2,000 to 2,500 is a good range right there. And other guys may have their own ideas about that, but that's what we do. All right, so now we want to be able to diagnose. We don't want to guess. All right, so we just have kind of a flow chart, much like a, a doctor or somebody else would when they're, when they're diagnosing and prescribing. We want to be able to do the same thing. So OFG, that's opportunity for growth. So if your technique, if you got an exit velo opportunity for growth, we're going to look at that technique as maybe it's your timing. So maybe it's either your gather, that's early or late. Your, first, your forward move, that's early or late. All right? your, your early connection at launch, you know, maybe that's a problem. You know, going down all these rabbit holes on the whiteboard paint, if you only took one takeaway, paint your walls with whiteboard because you can come up with some awesome stuff. Going down and figuring out our guys may have the wrong equipment. You know, meeting with uh, some of the designers of bats lately and understanding how a baseball bat is designed compared to a golf club. I mean, we are like in the dark ages compared to golf. They have, they have their grip is, is perfectly designed. They have the shaft based on their forearm length from elbow to hand. If it's longer than from your shoulder to your elbow, will determine your shaft length. They have shaft weights called swing weight. They have A0 to like G10. Right? And we've just got a few different ranges, especially college. We can only be within three. And we only get to swing 32s, 33s, or 34s. But then you got center of mass. Like, we've only got balanced bat and end loaded bat. Right? And so it's totally different. Golf is light years ahead, just like they were light years ahead when analyzing ball data 20 years ago. But, you know, somebody mentioned a question, asked a question about how do you hit the high induced vertical break, high spin guy top of the zone. Well, why are we using a long end loaded bat when we know a guy's throwing high induced vertical break? I think golf has 14 clubs in a golf bag, yet we use one bat and we find that bat by going, yeah, that feels pretty good, I'll take that one, All right? It's a lot that we can dissect there. If it's a physical problem with an opportunity for growth for exit velo, then Again, we're going to go back to what were his power metrics? What, what, how did he throw those med balls? What's his vertical jump? What's his TPI screen? What's, what's his firing sequence on KVS? Is this a guy that's just, he's got previous injuries in his career? Has he got something mentally prohibiting him from just cutting it loose 100%? Well, we've got to get past that. If it's an opportunity for growth for launch angle, right, and it's a technique thing, usually that's going to come down to attack angle in some way. All right, major league average, I think, is 8 to 14, but that's a pretty good attack angle, positive attack angle. Um, and then the bat and the equipment, are you just using the wrong stuff, right? Are your shoes too big and your foot sliding in your shoe and you're not able to access the ground reaction force from it? It's physical, same thing. We're going to get back to looking at your power metrics, your TPI screens, and your firing sequence. All right, so for the training for this, that picture is right outside from the pool, by the way. Uh, training for this, we're just going to, well, you can see what the, what the training is, but this is what we would prescribe, a, uh, 
variety of exercises that we would customize for the player based on what his needs are. Uh, but we believe that movement-based training um, is, is what we're going to go for. And we're going to do a lot of uh, corrective exercises and, and med ball type plyometric work. Uh, and one of the things on there was, was pull side BP in the air. That typically shows some of the best metrics for quality contact. So train it. Have you guys hit the ball in the air, pull side BP once in a while, let them cut it loose. Key performance indicator for consistent contact. So how often do you hit it? Again, this was a, a strike zone I got from Tango Tiger off Twitter. And uh, just, again, showing when you do swing, what are your, what are your contact rates? So when the ball is in the, se in the heart of the plate, in that dark red and red zone, uh, the best hitters in college baseball last year were made contact with that pitch 87% of the time. They're swinging, their contact rate is 60% uh, when they're swinging in the zone. That when they swing at fastballs, it's 84%. When they swing at off speed or something not a fastball, it's 71. But their overall contact rate when they swing, 78. So we just have some metrics uh, that we can compare against the best, which is obviously what you want to do. You want to be able to measure and you want to be able to compare against the best. So again, being able to diagnose and being able to look at some of the leading and lagging indicators of what this could be for opportunities for growth. Technique, again, um, you know, just looking at how the bat and the body come through the zone. So could be an early connection issue, could be that early connection variance where we want it within five degrees is not, and then the on-plane efficiency is not. Uh, if it's physical, again, we're going to look at the firing sequence, that's one of the biggest indicators, the firing sequence leading to inconsistent contact with the firing sequence being off. But then guys not being able to stay in posture and dynamic posture with spine angle and being able to stay, um, stay in, in good positions throughout their swing. And again, that's going to get down to some of those screens that we do with, uh, that we learned at our level one screening with Titleist. The training that we do for these, for guys that struggle to make contact when they swing, we'll do a lot of hand-eye drills, a lot of vision training. We'll give them a bunch of different bats of weights and sizes. Uh, we'll do a lot of early connection T. And again, we're going to mix. mix. A lot of our, our throwing isn't just a, a block training where everything's coming in on an underhand flip unless we're simulating a sinker ball guy. All right, so we're just going to try to mix it up and, and not let them fall into these patterns where they're training slower than the game, but faster than the game. All right, that way when they do swing in the game, they, uh, the game slows down for them. So here's some examples of how this works or how we used it. So the guy jumping on the right, number 22, that's Jordan Brewer. He was a third-round pick of the Astros last year. This was him hitting in the fall. Now, he's a third-round pick, but he went into the fall – as a junior college guy that we would very easily just call raw, right? Because he's a guy that was a tremendous athlete, a 6'5 runner. He vertically jumped 40.1 inches. He's a football player. He's a Division I wide receiver that didn't play Division I football. And it's like, well, why didn't you play Division I football? Well, I, I had an injury in high school. Okay, what was your injury? Well, he's a right-handed hitter, left-handed thrower, and he, in a football game, tore his right labrum. So the 90-90 test, that's external rotation. Okay, now this is a guy who hits the ball consistently 100 to 105 miles an hour, but he's hitting it straight into the ground. He jumps 40 inches off the ground. He's got tremendous vertical thrust. He's a tremendous athlete. He hits the ball hard, but he hits it on the ground, and we're asking him to hit it in the air, but he can't hit it in the air because he can't get a positive attack angle because he can't externally rotate past 90 degrees. Even in athletic position, he can't go past 90 degrees. He can't go past 90 degrees standing up. So how, if he can't go past 90 degrees, how is he going to get on plane to match swing plane to pitch plane when he can't do this? He's stuck here. He has a swing like that. It's like, oh, got it. That's it. So he came in with a very tall stance because he was always told, hey man, you're really fast. Just hit it on the ground and beat it out. Well, the easiest adjustment that we could make for him in a short window of time, dude, that's just like usually the simplest way when you want to get on their level, just start your sentence with dude. So dude, just like spread out more and crouch down a little bit more. 
That's just by lowering you and spreading you out and using your legs, not too wide, but let's see if we can just make a simple adjustment to get your swing that you've got to match the pitch plane. He's the Big Ten Player of the Year. Third round pick. He's a tremendous athlete. But that was just a simple adjustment of knowing, eliminating the frustration of a guy who physically can't get into a good positive attack angle because he's limited from a previous injury or just, just because of what his body can't do. A couple more examples of stuff like this <clears throat> with the body swing connection. So the torso rotation test. So it's leaving your lower body stable and just rotating the upper body. Can you make a smooth, can you rotate smoothly in your upper body? All right, and then you look at our guy. And our guy, look at his left shoulder just climb right away. His left shoulder vertically just clears out of there right away. That's not a smooth torso turn. Why? Well, he failed miserably the T-spine mobility test, which is this torso rotation test. When he does the torso rotation test, his whole body turns, okay? His knees, his, his body, everything turns. Everything's connected. He can't separate that. So that triangle down there of having to connect baseball to your medical team, to your strength team. Everybody's got to be in that triangle of communication to have the best player, the best dude you can possibly have. Because the medical team and the strength team would have to really work because of his T-spine immobility. All right, he really struggles to make consistent contact. Because what's he doing? He's flying open. His left shoulder's getting out of there on his swing. He's hitting out and around the ball. Every ball that he hits to the pull side's got tremendous amount of top spin or side spin. What did I do as a coach early in his career? Okay, let's try this off-center drill. Let's try this, this, uh, this velo machine. Hey, let's do this inside T. I did external cueing. I'm comparing him to, say, trout, right? And that's not fair to him because that's not what his body can physically do. So the other guy jumping is Jack Blomgren. He's our shortstop. Now, Jack failed the wrist test. All right, so he was a guy, so he couldn't pronate and supinate his wrist, wrist flexion extension and the wrist hinge test. All right, he just had a lot of wrist immobility issues. All right, so you watch him swing, and you look at where his top hand pronates right there. All right way at the end of his swing when his shoulder's doing the move, not his wrist. This is a guy, you look at the two of them jumping in the air. He's a 39.1 vertical jump. He's an unbelievable athlete. He's one of those guys, like his abs start like, like right below his chest, and he looks like a Lego guy, like just jacked. I mean, he is, he is so strong. So his vertical thrust is really good. His rotary... Core strength is really good. He's got a bazooka for an arm across the infield. I mean, he's got some of our hardest infield strength across the field, so his arm chop power is fine, but he's wrist immobile. So you go to uh, sources of power. And for him, the wrist was the one part of the chain that was preventing that true bat speed and exit velo from coming out. And so we gave him a lot of wrist mobility drills. And you see the tennis racket in there, a badminton racket, a tennis racket, but where he is swinging that tennis racket and forcing himself to pronate that wrist. Right? You can listen for it when you hear your players swing a bat. Just listen for the sound. This is great coaching on where you want them to make contact. Where you want them to make contact is where it's the loudest. right? And hopefully that's the same place that's in contact area. But we did that in two weeks. This was our biggest gainer in the last couple of years that he went up 89 to 98 in two weeks just by doing these drills. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal increase in growth. All right, this last one here. So these are the, look at the kinematic firing sequences first. Okay, and the one on the top, it shows a poor deceleration in the pelvis because the red line, you see the red line starts to go up and then it kind of just looks like a, you know, just kind of, a, we called it a soggy pelvis. So you don't want to be called a soggy pelvis. But it didn't decelerate. This was a guy who was always told his whole life that he's got to create separation, create separation, create separation. So he created separation in the load. And then his, 
hips would just go, his pelvis would go, and it would never stop. All right, so he never slowed his pelvis down. So for eight weeks, from September to November, all right, we gave him a lot of med ball plyo drills of the lead leg block, where he stands up and forces his pelvis to stop. So he's a right-handed hitter, so we'll put this knee up, and he's doing drills where his pelvis can't go anywhere. He just drills where it stops, and he throws them down. Two sets of four, two times a week, three times a week. And then his graph is much better deceleration within just two months. All right, and that's a good uh, pelvic rotation and pelvic thrust up top. And again, crashing the bike. You want to feel that deceleration, just as important as acceleration, if not more important. So again, this is all building the engine. We want to get these players. We want to, this isn't about necessarily stats or performance. We just want to make these guys the strongest and fastest versions that they can possibly be. We want to build this engine because what ends up happening is this leads directly to what we're ultimately coaching. If we're coaching, then we're in the business of confidence boosting. And that's, in essence, what our program is about. So thank you. LFG is what we say. Let, let's effing grow, not go, let's effing grow. All right, thank you very much. Um, Coach, you showed three hitters um, that failed mobility screens, essentially. How do you determine whether you address the mobility or make a mechanical change to work around the mobility? I, you, you said what? I showed three what? The three hitters you showed uh, failed some sort of mobility screen. Right. How do you decide whether you're going to attack the mobility itself or make a mechanical change to sort of work around their mobility limitations? So it's, again, it gets back to technical or physical? Is it a technical problem or a physical limitation, right? And if it's a physical limitation, like what their bodies had some immobilities, then those corrective exercises would be part of their training before they ever swing a bat. They're coming into the cage, they're doing, whether it's chop or, or uh, med ball work or, or some type of body movements, movement prep, whatever it is, they're attacking that before they start hitting for the day. Uh, if it's a technical problem, something with their swing and swing mechanics, uh, then we'll address that too. But a lot of these guys, we've only had one guy in two years that had a perfect score. Everybody's got room for improvement and opportunity for growth, whether it's stability or mobility uh, or strength. A lot of these guys failed the glute strength test, and that is just what we know now about uh, a huge power source of being able to use the glute in, in a swing. Um, a lot of guys do a lot of that work as well. Um, Coach, knowing all that you know now and the systems you have in place, how has this changed recruiting for you? How has this changed what? Recruiting. You know, we're, college coaches are at the disadvantage of we don't get the medical screens and we don't, we don't have that. So uh, fortunately, uh, there are some recruiting websites that do uh, you know, have either the bat sensor data on them or do some type of, of testing, whether it's spark testing or whatever. Uh, we try to build it into our camps as much as we can without triggering that tryout combine slash deal. Um, but it's, it's hard, so we, uh, we ask a lot of questions. Uh, I would say that's probably been the biggest change in recruiting is just getting a little bit more like a sniper with our questions and their background and what they, you know, how they've trained and injuries they've had and just the type of athletes they are and the type of movers that they are. Uh, but if we had, if we were recruiting two guys and they were of equal ability and one passed all his mobility stability screens and the other one failed half of them and was like a 30, we would take the 30 every time because there's huge upside growth in that guy. If they're both equal players and one guy's He's good. He's, he's doing everything right, and this guy's got a ton of growth. We'll take that guy. Coach, after executing your screenings, and if that athlete cannot make those improvements quickly, do you use your screens to share with the player these are pitch location vulnerabilities to enhance the pitches that you're potentially hunting? So you're saying if, uh, if he has some type of immobility that precludes him from hitting a low pitch or a high pitch, do we build a 
pitch plan or a, or a program for him based on his strengths. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, we would do that. We would. We always want to. We always want to uh, maximize the strengths of our players first, and then highlight those opportunities for growth second. Um, the individual plan, the scouting plan, is going to be based on who the pitcher is that we're facing that day and how to attack that guy. But in terms of building the engine and building the hitter, we want to maximize their strengths for sure. All right, thank you guys.